Presented by the Hockey Shop Source for Sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com. We are back together with the co-founders of Ingle Magazine, David Hutchison and Kevin Woodley. I'm Darren Millard. This is a lot of fun as we gear up. Training camps are underway all across the junior hockey world. We've got rookie camps on the horizon and then main camps in just a week or so in the National Hockey League as we... Uh, point our way towards the 2023-24 season. Remember what back in the day when you thought that like that's futuristic. And and now we got the 24 season on the horizon, Woody. Oh man, like you're making me feel old. This will be my my first game covering the NHL for Associated Press was 2000, so I guess this is my 23rd season. Wow. 2000. So oh hey, listen, like March that, 8th, 2000. I believe was it March 8th? Oh yeah, so that no, no, no. Sorry, years, March eighth yeah. is the Bertuzzi one. I think it was February or something. My first game on the beat for the Associated Press, first game I ever covered by myself. Still in journalism school, hadn't got my degree yet. McSorley waxed Brashear with the clock running out. Oh, the that stick. was my trial by fire. Yeah, really. So, uh, never wow. forget that. Yeah, I mean, uh, the only good news is when the Bertuzzi Moore incident happened, I knew how to handle it because I had firsthand experience with those types of things. But yeah, that was my first ever game as a reporter for the Associated Press was McSorley, Wack, and Brashear. Hey, going to just do a little detour here. Who did you lean on the night of McSorley, Brashear, who maybe helped you get through that? Was there a reporter, uh, a media member, or did you just go on instinct and hope? I think that um, because of the nature of it, the veteran reporters don't have time to hold the hand of a rookie, right? Like this situations like that, you've got people looking for the ambulance, leaving the Zamboni entrance uh, and out onto the street. Uh, They know what to look for there. You've got people that know to go, like you're not getting press conference, you know, everything buttoned down. If you want to really do your job there, you're chasing down quotes. You're not hesitating in the tunnel. You're getting the material you need. And I was a little too meek at that point to be as aggressive as other words. others were. Um, but I learned from watching, you know, I mean, I mean, especially a guy like a name that people might still, re- you know, still around and has been a really great mentor in other, in other ways. And over the years is Ian McIntyre, who I really look up to. So watching him work and, what he put together on deadline the next morning, watch it, reading it the next morning in the paper, his story was like, Oh, that's how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next time on though. Were we at the same game? Yeah, ex- <laughs> exactly. It was a little, cha- it was a little chaotic, uh, obviously. And, um, yeah. Uh, but as I said, it prepared me for other things and you, you, you learn as you go. And, uh, and I will say again, like that night, everyone was, I mean, they're not, they don't have time to hold your hand and help you, but, that doesn't mean they're not helpful and guys like Ian McIntyre and Tony Gallagher and, and Ed Willis and some of the veterans, Terry Bell that were on that beat were so good to me back in the day in terms of helping me learn the ropes of how you do this job. IMAC. Uh, you can't uh, go wrong with, uh, with IMAC, uh, with uh, covering the beat and his experience and his knowledge and uh, just a friendly guy. I love, uh, I love Ian McIntyre. That's a, that's a cool little story. It, it kind of makes me think about goalies, uh, Hutch, if you're called up and then all of a sudden you're backing up and then you're in the game after 10 minutes against a per first place team, like, well, this is happening so fast and you just kind of make it up until you, until you're exposed. Yeah. I just hope it doesn't turn out the way Woody just described. And you look at the box score the next day and think of the other guy and say, oh, that's the way it's supposed to be done. <laughs> I, it was my, it was my e-bug moment. It was my e-bug journalism moment because I literally yeah, just- had never covered a game before. It was my first one. Sounds totally like that. Uh, so we've got camps underway. I know Hutch, uh, little Hutch, uh, is involved in the, in the Western Hockey Lake. Yeah. The, what kind of buzz you feeling around uh, around things right now as as he gets set for uh, a Western Hockey Lake campaign? Well, I'm getting good reports. He's really happy, and uh, his mother went and saw camp. But maybe this is your goalie parent tip of the day. I haven't been over there to watch anything yet. I've just sort of kept my nose out of it. It's his journey. It's his experience with the team and the coaches, and I'm just letting it all ride. And he seems really, really happy. So, being the uninvolved parent, which means which means Uncle Kevin has to take him golfing next week. That is also true. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's a good idea. Get some intel over there with, the, <laughs> with Uncle Kevin. Uh, so, do you ask? 
How much do you ask? Oh, what's your process there? Oh, it's really up to him. It's really up to him. I just let him guide the conversation when he calls. Uh, I mean, I assume that the approach to me from the team is sort of an amplification of what they're probably thinking about all goalie parents. So here's my tip for you. The night before he was drafted uh, into the Western League a couple of years ago, the general manager of the team phoned me and he wanted a conversation with me because he was worried that being involved in the goaltending world, quote unquote, that I would be interfering and a distraction and a problem for him and the team. Um, I'm, I'm very proud to say that he's told me many times since that it's been anything but, and he sees me as uh, one of the best parents they have on the team for my approach. And so I'm very conscious of that. And I've also heard from others around the goalie world that should Maddie ever get to the level where, where pro teams are considering one day, the same questions will be raised. So, uh, but I honestly think, and I know from some experiences in the minor hockey world that coaches look at goalie parents and probably all parents in a very similar light. And they're worried about what that relationship with the team and their kid will be like. So I'm trying to be as hands off as I possibly can in all of this. I know Matthew absolutely adores his goalie coach in Vancouver, Paul Fricker, a bit of a Yoda himself in the, in the goalie world and his approach to the game. And I know that Paul's exactly what Matthew needs during the season. So he doesn't need me buggering that up for him. Um, so he just tells me how it's going and I tell him, I think it's fantastic. And honestly, uh, when he's heading out for a practice or a game, the only thing I say to him is go out there and have fun and be yourself. So that's it. Is that hard to have a step back? It's not because I believe that he's in good hands. I'm very comfortable with the people that are working with him. And I meant that quite honestly, when I said that, uh, Paul is exactly what Matthew needs right now and uh that i could only screw it up so it's maybe it's just self-realization i don't know but he's in really good hands you handle woody the same way don't you i was just gonna say this is how i parent my kids i just defer everything to my wife and say they're in better hands (laughs) (laughs) Uh, i get the don't be you please don't be you for like 20 minutes don't be don't be you uh we've got a couple of great uh, feature interviews uh double dip uh today Annalise Bergman, uh, goaltender at Cornell, will join us, uh, Team USA's pipeline and USA Hockey's pipeline. And Gage Alexander, a a great story, Anaheim uh, draft choice, giant. We're talking a giant, but uh, what a path uh, to get to professional hockey through the Western Hockey League. Uh, Very unique uh, part of the pandemic uh, pathway. So we'll get into uh, Gage and Annalise in just a little bit uh, as we check in on our gear segment uh, presented by The Hockey Shop, source for Sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com. And we're and th- this is funny. You guys get all the gear and you see all the gear and you get the names of the gear and then I get it. And I never know how to actually say the gear when I first see it, when I f- first see it released. Because it's the true line and it's seven X three. But at times I'm like, is that seven times three? Is that what, 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 what is it? But you guys are, are on it. It's the seven X three, uh, Pat. Yeah. And, uh, let me just, I'm just trying to go through our YouTube comments really fast here as you were talking, Darren, because there are a handful of people that are going to be super excited. Uh, mini mumpy thon is one of them obviously their their screen names uh um, speaking of struggling to read things yes brandon anderson is another one like we had so many people reaching out to us in the comments for other gear reviews saying could you please do the 7x3 true line please 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 we've done it this is part of the problem we apologize we know you wanted it sooner one we had to wait till they had enough in stock at the hockey shop for us to talk about it two there's so much new gear coming in every week at the hockey shop. And this is sort of one of those lingering effects of the pandemic. There are lines. And, you know, speaking of Annalise Bergman and Gage Alexander, we were obviously these are two people we met at the CCM event we were at in Montreal last week. And some of the lines we saw there are part of this year's launch. They're not next spring. So there's new gear coming all the time. Like it used to be everything drop in the spring. And we rolled through it as the summer went along. We have stuff dropping all the time later in the summer. And we can't keep up. They can't keep up at the hockey. Well, they can at the hockey shop. They have it all. They keep up. But we've only got one segment a week. So 
If you're looking for the latest and greatest, as much as you want us to get the review up so you can look at it as we talk about it, like we do today with the 7X3 line, you can always call Cam and his crew at the hockey shop. Look at thehockeyshop.com to see what the latest is. Ask them for their opinions. Um, They'll help you out. Uh, So 7X3, we've been waiting for it. It's finally, well, it's been there for a while, but it's finally here with us in a review. This is True's mid-price point line. In terms of what you get and don't get out of it, I say we just go to Cam and let him explain. Welcome back to the Hockey Shop Source for Sports. I'm here in Goal Utopia with Cam Matwiv. And we have... Yes, I, you've been asking for it, folks. We see the comments. I apologize it's <laughs> taken us this long to get to the new True 7X3 line. But we've been busy. As yeah. I've said yes. on the podcast so many times, there is so much new gear coming in that once a week is not enough to keep up. But wait no longer. The wait is over. True Catalyst 7X3. Cam, I've kind of stumbled before in terms of what the new numbers mean yeah what's canada what's offshore what's different what's the price point so i'm going to leave this one to you tell me what 7x3 is all about so true's mid price point gear so this now kind of completes the the lineup of like the you know good better best scenario for okay example. so walk me through best so your px3 better 9x3 good 7x3 Excellent. Although yes. it's better than good, folks, but just to yes. give you the idea of the tier. It is better than good. Better than, than good. good. So why is it better than good? So, so in terms of how it's built, how it's designed to play, this is your scaled down, price down version of True's PX3 line. Correct. Okay. And also now available in Intermediate. That's a big step. Obviously, yes. kids couldn't get that gear in Intermediate before. Now you can. Folks, Remember, if you're like, oh, that's great, Kevin, but what's the PX3 line all about? Mm-hmm. You can go back and check our YouTube video on the PX3 line. Maybe it's there, but it's, it, it's going to be. There'll be a link. There'll be, be a link in here. So, what's scaled different? down version, intermediate, yeah. price point. Walk yes. me through it all. 100%. All right. So, we'll use the intermediate pad as a good starting point here. So, first of all, starting at the boot of the pad. Okay. Pro laces. They make the return, but it's just their stock base model. So, this is just elastic, regular bungee, you know. Price point up, we see the Prolace Hybrid um, included on there, which is obviously a great option. But again, we need to change some things somewhere. So um, stock elastics, same style of open boot that you became accustomed to already. And to be honest, that's kind of the theme with this pad. I mean, in all honesty, a lot of it is... So flat boot, not a Flat tabletop boot, yeah. So it's going to sit on top of your skin. Oh, very much so, So fit-wise, this is going to sit higher. Your 34 might sit higher than a 34 you've worn in the past. that's a stock sizing note for all of the catalysts, not just specifically this model, for example. So PX, we've said this again, go back to the video. PX3, 9X3, 7X3, same thing. It's going to fit a little taller because of the boot. Yes, and and like kind of what I was touching on there is that, you know, for as much as there is like, you know, small nuance differences, all of this stuff is very, very close to that next price point up, just in terms of overall feel-wise, playability, everything on your leg. It's not like you're taking an immediate nosedive down um, as you're tearing through the price points, for example. So we do see that FRS system return on both the senior, as Kevin's got on his hand, and the intermediate, as I've got in mine. FRS, fast rotation system, something that the Lefebvre's added after switching over to, well, basically becoming and working with True and, and working on their own. So been very popular. Uh, we've seen it adopted by a lot of pros. Um, just a, a way to sort of get that balance between a pad that's really connected to your leg and also still allows for enough openness that it's going to rotate and flush the ice and rotate as you come back up out of the butterfly and stay square. Correct. So it offers a lot of adjustability. Obviously, a little bit more scaled down when it comes to the intermediate pad to fit those smaller legs. So starting now with some of the differences between an intermediate and senior, we don't have their, we'll call it speed skin-esque material on the intermediate pad that goes through all sizing. On the senior pad, we're going to find it on the all white, the white and blue, the white and red, 
but not on the all black because they don't have it in black. Okay. So you're just going to get a standard regular, Gen Pro regular on Regular Gen Pro. So the same thing is that you're getting on the, uh, the Intermediate Series. And this really is the same material that you're getting and if you were to order a PX3 with their, their fast sliding material, Correct. if you were to get it in a 9X3, it's not a scaled down version. It's the same, same durability, same, same type of material. Same stuff. Where are the differences in materials then? And the internals? It has to be a lot into the internals. It's like the Gem Pro to me still feels of of quality. So I, again, a lot of this is going to fall into, okay, well, what's the, happening in the core of the pack? Um, obviously, assembly is going to be the exact same. Like we're still having like a similar, you know, lacing. Still got that NHL legal style like calf plate and things like that. So again, there's a lot more similarities than differences. But it does come down to the core of the pad. And don't get me wrong. This is still that stiff style. Oh, yeah, if you're looking for flex above the knee, this yeah. ain't it. Like this is a no. very stiff pad. Above the knee again has has flex at the boot, which exactly. is designed to. But above the knee, this is a very stiff pad. And it, it, we were, you know, we're following the lines of we wanted that thinner thigh rise to be able to have that low cross in that stance, for example. But as a give and take, you always got to stiffen that back up so we prevent that. Well, kind and of I mean, let's stuff. be honest. Like the the reality is that's a pro preference. Like most NHLers for years through true through other brands like the preference has been but some guys like it soft at the bottom some don't but from the knee up a stiffer pad that's not going to allow to have too much flexibility for pucks to squeak through the five hole correct okay glove blocker so glove i've got an intermediate one Kevin your little, Senior. little baby hands so intermediate offset t helps with ease of closure these have a really good game ready feel right right off the shelf Again, this glove in my hand doesn't necessarily feel like a mid price point glove. It's a lot of richness to it. You know, it feels like it's it's more, uh, which is definitely not a bad thing. Um, all are going to be a 590. Again, offset T in the intermediate. Senior is going to feature a double T with skate lace, as you see there. But easy, 590 closure off the bat. The inside of the glove does need to be adjusted up just from the start. Just comes kind of a little bit loose in some areas, a little bit tight in some. So you got to get it on your hand. You got to play around with it to get it kind of set up. But once you do, I find it's got a great feel to it. Um, again, nothing too, too crazy here to, to really go over. This is the very kind of bread and butter-ish for, you know, what would be a Lefebvre design 590. Not too much different here than what you've seen in the past, for sure. All right, blocker. Once again. Speaking of not too much different. Exactly. So I was used to say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Bit so, of a, I mean, it's a beefy was the word we've always used. Yeah. And you Dating know back to their CCM days. That's not necessarily a bad thing at like this price point. Cause again, it's giving that feel of richness and more to it. Whereas a lot of products sometimes we'll see that kind of downgrade, especially when you get into those lower price points here, it still feels kind of just as thick, um, just as uh, beefy. We'll, we'll go with beefy. beefy. What is not on here that I would get in the upper? Oh, the sugar palm is a good place to start. So it's just a standard Nash palm. Um, obviously, the core of the blocker itself is going to be a little bit uh, different as well. So it's just standard HD uh, and LD blocks of foam. But uh, beyond that, in terms of shape, cut, overall general feel-wise, yeah, I'm pretty much the same. Interesting to note, you've got a zipper on the back of the blocker. Yes. Which has been a long-standing design, one that uh, we've seen CCM carry over with theirs as well. Not on the intermediate, but... But on the, on the senior level. Correct. We've seen NHLers. Now, 595 on the blocker, yes, which is that's buying English. English. We've seen NHLers. I know NHLers. I've watched them do it. Take out the blocker board and replace it. Mm -hmm. So if this is a lower HD foam blocker board, could you, in theory, order blocker boards and swap them out? FBI, stop where you are. Give us a call, 604-589-8299 or 1-800-567-7790. Oh, did I stumble on secret sauce that can't be said publicly? You gotta call Cam, you gotta call Cam to get the answers to my questions. He can't say it into the ether of so, the YouTube. So, lots of colors. Quickly recap everything here. So, intermediate goes down from 29 plus two all the way to 31 plus two. Is plus two standard? Plus two is standard. Um, senior, starting at 32 and up. Um, we've got colors. We've got stock. Again, as you'd expect as, as, as a mid-price point pad, the 7X3, this is not something you're custom ordering. You're not getting custom details on it. This is a stock pad in store, but it gives you the ability, and for the first time at Intermediate, to come in, get a pad, and walk out same day being able to play it, which is not something you were able to do with past iterations of True. So as we see them continue to grow out their lines, it's making it more available for goaltenders of every age and every level than it was when they first introduced the product. 
and that's a good thing. More options for more goaltenders. That's a win, Cam. Check us out at thehockeyshop.com. Make sure you like and subscribe. Much anticipated 7X3, and it's the mid price point line. What does that translate to? You know, that's probably is a good question. As soon as we finished filming that, I said to Cam, you know, we we called this their, you know, it's their it's their lower price point, it's their mid price point. I mean, the biggest thing I think is there's intermediate sizing. That's been a big part of the new offshore lines uh, that they've unveiled. You know, coming down from the Catalyst PX3 line, um, so kids can get into it, which wasn't the case before. So that's important um, with the nine X three and the seven X three price point, Darren is, it, it's not quite half, but it's pretty close. Like a set of senior mm. sized pads in seven X three at the hockey shop right now is priced at 1299. I believe a nine X three is closer to $2,400. So you're almost half the price. Um, in the intermediate sizes, you're down to eight seventy nine for a set of pads. And again, remember, all the pads come with stock plus two sizing for a little extra height in the thigh rise. And that's a stiffer thigh rise, but you won't have overlap problems because in addition to being stiffer, they've thinned it out on the top portion to sort of prevent any sort of overlap problems. So if you have it a little tall as a young guy, you, you'll have some room to grow into it. Um, gloves, intermediate, $359 uh blocker 279 intermediate on the pro side it looks like the the glove is 399 and the blocker is 359 so again not quite half of what you'd pay for a 9x3 but you know in that range probably like 60 percent you know so 40 percent off range um if you got any questions about the pricing about because we've seen this before right like um we've seen guys and girls order pads in the lower price point line but maybe want a little more protection in their gloves. So they go pro level glove, right? So you can mix and match that way as well. Uh, make sure you give Cam and his crew a call. If you've got questions about the seven X three line about the padding, about what level it's going to be appropriate for, uh, you know, from a glove perspective, how much you're on the ice. Listen, the pads and the gloves to me, as you go down the segments, um, the tendency is to be softer, uh, in some brands, uh, but in this case, the stiffness of that thigh rise, as we talk about in the video, and make sure you check out the video, you can see me trying to squeeze it, is very much intact. Um, typically, you have a little lesser in terms of materials inside this stuff. Like, it's not the highest end material. Um, and it might break down a little, little faster because of the internal makeup of it. Not saying that's the case here. We haven't tested it. But that's typically what you get when you... So if you're on the ice five times a week, maybe it doesn't last as long as a pro-level set of pads would. Like there's, There has to be some give and take when you're paying almost half the price. The other thing I would say on the give and take side is it felt heavier to us uh, as we were sort of just reviewing it. And, and again, you know, uh, lighter materials cost more things like that. So that, that's to me the biggest difference, but not everyone needs... Not everyone has the money for pro level pads. And the truth is not everyone needs pro level pads. And that includes a lot of us beer leaguers. So uh, a really good option. Nice to see true expanding the lines. And if you have any questions, like I said, about where this fits, not just price point wise, but protection wise and for your game at the level you play it and however regularly you play it, make sure you give them a call. They'll, they'll make sure you get the gear you need for your game. That is an incredible synopsis uh, of a uh, very, much look forward to gear segment uh, brought to you by the hockey shop source for sports langley the hockey uh you mentioned overlap uh the access pads that i have have some overlap uh when you go into the butterfly i i like it uh how much should there be there well not all of us can have a butterfly as wide as yours darren so i'm jealous um honestly I think it's, ideally uh, the tops of your pads are going to seal when you go down to the butterfly not overlap but Good for yeah. you. Well, I, they're a little bit bigger. I like I I, I like them. I, I wanted them a little bit bigger. So uh, that's that's the only reason. Now why. listen. Now again, I'll go to a conversation with an NHL goalie um, who shortened the top of his pads from his max height and has demonstrated to me in the locker room doing butterfly drops in an NHL locker room to show me. Yeah, they're shorter, but look, they like you said, Hutch. When when I drop into a perfect butterfly they close perfectly at the top. And so I'm sealed. 
the reality of the game is you're not always in a perfect butterfly. Sometimes you're yeah. making a push and you're opening a up. And so that way, yep. you might want to have that extra inch, inch and a half. In the NHL, you're capped, but in other leagues, you're not. You might want to have that extra inch. So yeah, Darren, you overlap when you're in your your you know in a certain butterfly. But if you're extending across and opening up, you've given yourself that much more margin for error. You know, as you make a push for that that sort of overlap to sort of come apart and still be sealed. So. I'm with you, especially on breakaways and five hole and stuff like that. Having that yes. little extra coverage at the top, I like it too. And I'm as long as the pads thin enough at the top so that it doesn't hit on the way down and cause my legs to open up. Yeah. Um. You know, I, there are some goalies that prefer that. And again, the PX3 at the highest end, made in in Mon- in Montreal at the True Factories, the 9X3, which is their pro version made overseas, and now the 7X3 all have that thinned out. Um you know, that, that thinned out top of the thigh rise that we talked about sort of being developed. And we have videos of Freddie Anderson testing it because the original one was not stiff enough and, and it was flopping back and forth. And he actually had an eye, he had his iPhone on the ice to see how the pad moved when the puck hit the top of the thigh rise. I remember and, that. Um, so that's the process they went through to get to this. And, you know, not every goalie loves it. Uh, there are some guys in the NHL wearing PX3, but when you're in the room, you see that it doesn't have the thinned out thigh rise. It's actually more like the old 12-2. Um, but there are a lot of guys that have adopted it and like it for the very same reasons that Darren likes his to overlap. Well, that's awesome. Uh, a little bit of uh, whatever your preference is uh, on that side of it. And if you're looking for every possible break that you can get, like uh, the breakaway, you, boy, you read my mind on that. That's exactly what I'm thinking. When somebody tries to do that little uh, slider through and sneak it through, you, you might have a or, chance to make or that Or for us same. old school guys that still use a traditional VH. And you want that you yes. want that sort of coming and sealing that five hole before you push across as these, some of these young kids open you up. Yeah. I, in other words, you're not cheating. You're not trying for us old guys. We need all the help. We need all like the help the v- we can get, Darren. When, when, when you do use the VH, in the back of your mind, you're like, why am I doing this? Because that happens to me. I'm like, I shouldn't be doing this, but it feels so good. Yeah, I think, I think uh, we might start seeing a little bit more of it now that players are conditioned. Really? Yeah, now that players are conditioned to shoot for that top corner because they expect all goaltenders to drop down into the RVH. You know, especially guys who aren't six foot six like Gage Alexander, who we're going to be hearing from later on. If you don't have all that height that you can seal up in the RVH properly, you don't feel like using your face to seal the top of the net. Uh, VH, I think, might have a place still in the game. We were on the ice in Kelowna with Brad Kirkwood and Kristen Campbell, and they were working on sort of dead angle plays, and they started experimenting with the VH. And we had the shooters were like, there's nothing there when she started using VH. There was just, they felt like once they got into a certain spot on the dead angle, we had the puck on the ice, we're shooting video of it. They just felt like there was nothing there. That spot that they had been taught to look for in a reverse all of a sudden disappeared. And so at the end of the day, All of these methods have give and take to them. And I think to Hutch's point, I think you're already starting to see it a little bit. Some guys want to mix it. That unpredictability, the give and take, if the shooters are always looking for the give of an early drop, short side shoulder off the ear in a reverse, then take that away by mixing it up every once in a while, whether it's whether it's or maybe it becomes your go to. I do think we're going to see more of it. I'm with you, however, Darren. Nine times out of 10, when I do it, it's because I did it for so long when I was learning to play the position that it became instinctual, especially on the blocker side. And so when I do it and don't get away with it, I'm like, ah, you idiot. All you needed to do was use something else, a reverse or overlap. But And usually my problem is dropping into it on a guy who then pulls and cuts across the middle of the front of the net because it's low-level beer league and nobody plays defense. And now that push you have to make a cross requires because that vertical pad is up against the post. It has a long way to come to get down to the ice. So as you push off that post, that's where, again, that extra height on the thighs, I find you just open yourself up along the ice to get in tucked five hole a lot easier or a lot more often pushing out of VH than you would if you were just in a reverse and had the short side sealed. Incredible organic conversation that was never part of our pre-meeting. And the pre-meeting is pretty extensive on In Goal Radio, the podcast. Yeah, we talk about our kids, our family, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> like it's, it's extensive. You know what I love? And this is sort of uh, behind the curtain Uh-oh. stuff. Uh, I'll come in and we'll record. And I'll tell uh, the family, I'm going to record with, with uh, In Goal. And I'll come out like two and a half hours later. <laughs> and Jen will say, boy, that was a long recording. I'm like, actually, 
it wasn't this week. We were just chatting for for like ninety we minutes. We solve all the world's problems before we hit record. We do, or at least all of Kevin's we, problems. We do. Okay, there's that, and there, <laughs> there, there, there there's uh, there's enough problems with all of us to go around. So it's, we we we, share. we don't actually pay Darren to uh, host this show. We just pay him to be <laughs> Kevin's psychologist, <laughs> bartender. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got two great interviews this week uh, brought to you by Sensorina, Sensorina VR. Annalise Bergman, uh, goaltender at Cornell, and uh, we'll get uh, her great story in just a little bit. And Gage Alexander, and what a journey through the Western Hockey League. And he is six foot six. And imagine the overlap on his pads, <laughs> like how tall those things would have to be. But six foot six, uh, crazy. Uh, and uh, his uh, journey through the Western Hockey League in Winnipeg and uh, Swift Current, and then to the American Hockey went from Western League to the American Hockey League in the same year. Which Mid-season. That, mid-season, yeah. Uh, n- never happens. Uh, we'll get to that uh, as we uh, pay some uh, some uh, credit to Sensorina, Sensorina VR. We transition from the summer program into training camps and what everybody's working on, Hutch. It's uh, it's training camp now. The season is here. We've been talking all summer about how Sense Arena is an incredible tool to get you ready for your camp, to get you prepared for the year. That little bit of extra virtual ice that maybe you uh, can't grab in the summer. Well, it's a great tool during the season for you as well. Would you like a little bit of extra time to sharpen up? Is your son or daughter playing for a minor hockey team that only practices two or three times a week, but maybe they want to be practicing their goaltending six days a week? Sensorine is there for you. Would you like to use it as a great tool to warm up before you go on the ice? We're starting to see a few Sensorina uh, units in hockey rinks. Kids want to get out there and face some real shots before they hit the ice. You want to sharpen your skills like Devin Levi and sit there and watch virtual pucks so that you can learn to read releases, puck trajectories, and so on. Just a fantastic tool all year long to add to your goaltending kit. So Sensory Nut, there's great deals on. As always, if you subscribe to their annual plan, you get everything in the package from the drills to the training programs to the NHL shooters, the neurocognitive drills. It's just a full toolkit uh, for goaltenders today. Check it out at sensorina.com. Of course, as always, use the fancy code IGM50 and you'll save a little bit more money on top of whatever great deal they've got going on. Kevin can't hold himself back again. Let's go, Woody. You can, well, you're reading the body language there's, of Kevin. There's Archie. new drills like that. Like, this is the other part about Sensorina. You don't just buy it and you get what you get when you pay for it. But they just had an update, and it includes new cognitive drills to improve focus, high, hand-eye coordination, and spatial orientation. So, if you think you get bored, not that you would get bored, but say you've been doing all their cognitive drills and you're like, ah, you know, I've done these. It's becoming routine. There's always new stuff coming and the newest launch, the newest release on the platform has a whole bunch of new sort of off ice cognitive training drills that can help you improve. Like I said, your focus, your visual acuity and your hand eye coordination. So I just love that it's constantly evolving and there's all kinds of deals you can include and try it for free right now. And some specials on as we get into the hockey season and a hockey season that's going to have all 32 NHL teams, you'll be able to go into their rinks and choose their jerseys, whether they're shooting on you or you're wearing it. Part of their new partnership with the National Hockey League. So it's not just, and it's more than just a partnership, as Hutch said. NHL goalies use this, including Devin Levi, uh, who we had a chance to spend time with in Montreal as a very important part of their training. So it is, as Hutch said, it's legit. It's the real deal. Hey, I've got some advice. If you're a brand out there and you're thinking you'd like to work within Goal Magazine uh, to reach more goaltenders around the world than anybody else, make sure that when you talk to us, you say, I want Hutch doing the read on the podcast because then you're guaranteed to get Woody chiming in for another 60 seconds on top of that. So you get two for one deal if you make sure I do the read first. And you get paid and he can't help himself. Exactly. Because you're the spokesperson. Isn't it great? Yeah. Yeah. It's just awesome. That's a, that's a big one for everybody. It's because Woody knows all the details and I miss some. So he just has to jump in and make sure we get them all. I I like how excited Woody gets as as you're wrapping up your, your, yeah. Like he's holding Don't up forget. his arm. He's that jumping. shows you how much he loves the people that we work with too. And it shows you how much he loves his sensory yeah. in it. Don't forget guys. Yeah. And right now he's trying to pretend that he's so calm. I know, he's just ignoring cool. me. 
and ready. I'm trying, I'm trying I, not to hop in with another three points. He's, uh, that he's F-bombing Hutch in the background is what he's doing. They're constantly adding stuff. So like, it's actually hard. Just like Woody, Sensorina is constantly adding stuff. It's hard to keep up with what to read each week. That was good, Hutch. I like it. Okay, Thank I'm going to shut up now. Just go to the interviews. Annalise Bergman is awesome. Do you know? Do you know what it'd be like if 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 Woody was a phone or an, some kind of app? Like there would be a new update every three hours. Update available. <laughs> I also, I was in a good mood um, this morning. I'm chatty. I'm bubbly. Things are going good. Don't bring me down, boys. Let me be chatty and bubbly. You guys were in Montreal. You mentioned Devin Levi. Uh, so uh, an opportunity to connect with uh, a couple of goaltenders. And uh, Annalise Bergman is uh, out of the gate uh, with our first feature interview of this episode, a uh, goaltender at Cornell. Well, this is a quick hit, right? Like we had some windows built into our the official CCM event where they came over and spent some time with us. And I got to be honest, I'm looking forward to catching up with Annalise at the end of her season. She is busy now back at Cornell, which I don't know if you've heard is probably a tough school to get into and and keep up with. Um, th- so this is really just a quick get to know Annalise Bergman. And there were some things that I didn't know about her that I found out as the as the event went on that I wish I'd been able to ask. We're going to save that for this is all me saying we've got a part two coming with her down the road and I can't wait for it because. Um, you know, some of the details that didn't get in here, like she spent a week facing and the top NHL shooters at the CAA camp, um, would have loved to have asked her about that. So, um, a big part of USA hockey's future. She's had success on the international stage with them already at a very young age is already playing NCAA hockey at Cornell. And just let's get to know Annalise Berkman a little more. And really excited to welcome to the Ingle Radio podcast for the first time, for hopefully first time of many, Annalise Bergman. This is just going to be quick, a quick get to know you with Annalise Bergman. So one of the things we always do with our goalies at every level is how did it start? Where'd the passion start? How'd you become a goalie? I was about three years old. I hopped on the ice with my brothers and I just fell in love with it. I started playing mini mites in Buffalo and just threw on the pads and then I knew as soon as I put them on, I just didn't want to take them off. So you, when was the first, like you're on the ice at three. When's the first time you had the pads on? Uh, four. So four years old, you started goaltending. What'd you love about it? Just the fact that I was the only goalie for my team. You know, I could be the difference maker out there. Um, just, it's such a unique position. And I feel like, you know, you kind of have to be, you know, unique to play and a little weird. So it was perfect for me. So I loved it. Okay, so you mentioned brothers. Like a lot of origin stories tend to be like the little brother or the little sister who gets thrown in net. Also, you have to love to want to be on the ice all the yes. time. So, where, where did, you, like, how do brothers play into this? Um, every time they went on the ice, they would, you know, invite me out there and throw me in that because they love to shoot. Even just in our driveway playing street hockey net, they'd throw on the pads and I'd hop in there and just, you know, stand there for a little bit. But I've learned how to move a little bit more since then. I was just going to say, okay, so from just out there playing, having fun, to heading to Cornell next year, uh, two years with USA on the, uh, the, U, the under-18 championships. Obviously, there's been a big evolution. Give us sort of, for those who don't know you, descri- describe your game for us. Yeah. Um, well, I've grown up playing with the boys. You know, This is going to be my first year playing with the girls. So just the evolution of my game, I really focused on the technicality of the skating. And I think that's where a lot of it stemmed from, is making sure every movement was precise. Back in Buffalo, I'd be on the ice two hours every Sunday, even when I was six, seven years old. And so just from there, it's kind of taken off. I traveled to Detroit, kept playing there with the guys, um, and then got the opportunity to play with USA, and it's been really exciting. Okay, so skating is the foundation. Uh, Any coaches we should shout out along the way? Because I think we hear skating as goalies, like, what is goalie skating? Is it just crease movement patterns? Now we see a lot of, you know, edge work. Uh, A lot of the guys we work at the pro level, they're, they're, you know, it's not just crease movement. They're like... Uh, you know, we had Devin the other day, we we're out on the ice doing his warm ups, and it's all like edge work to the blue line and yeah. back. Like, what does goalie skating mean to you, and why are you good at it? Yeah, I think, well, to shout out to goalie coach Jeff Lurg, he's helped me tremendously throughout these past years. He's in Detroit. But skating for me is just, you know, how are you going to save the puck if you can't even get there? So just being able to slide and lateral release and all those different movements, movements that you can use just. Super helpful. Okay. So uh game in the NAHL this year, which got a lot of attention, a lot of headlines. Walk me through what that experience was like. 
not just from a playing perspective, but the attention it garnered and how you managed the pressure of that rink and knowing that we're that many more eyes. Like I know you'd been yeah. on the big stage with, yeah. with the women's team, but was that different? Was it? Yeah, it was a lot different. It felt like, you know, a different kind of pressure just because it had never happened before. And when I got the phone call, you know, immediate, you know, excitement, but the nerves already starting, you know, just kind of getting in preparation because my season had ended at that point. Um, so getting back on the ice and everything. Um, and then uh, luckily I got to go there a week before I hopped in the game and the night before is really kind of when the nerves hit me. Um, but you know, just, I played the thought I'll play the way I play and just went out there and did what I do best. Okay. And I was going to say like, like we love takeaways. We love things that goalies can listen and be like, Ooh, that would help me. Yeah. how do you manage those nerves? Like, what, do you have, you know, we see like different mental tips, mental advice. It becomes a skill as yeah. we evolve as goaltenders. How do you handle the nerves of that situation? And, you know, the nerves of playing for, you know, USA on big stages as well. Yeah. Um, I'd always just come back to, you know, this is hockey. I'm going to, I've done this a million times before, you know, there's nothing a lot different about this. I just always look down at a piece of my equipment. It'd always be a little toe strap on the bottom of my pad or something um, to kind of remind myself to bring me back to, you know, just, do what you do one save at a time. Okay. So you focus on a piece of gear. Like we've seen some goalies over the years, uh, right up to the NHL level, write a message on their blocker, write something on their sticks, any yes. messages or any mantras? Uh, no mantras right now. I kind of just keep that mind clear. Yeah. I just like keeping the mind clear, to be honest, no words or extra thoughts in there. Just save the puck kind of. Okay. Uh, one shot at a time. You mentioned it's quite often the easiest thing to say, but the hardest thing to do as a goalie. Yes, definitely. It just experience allow you to get to that mindset? Yeah, definitely. Just the repetition that you have and kind of just muscle memory at that point allows you to hopefully save every puck in that instance. Okay. Um, who'd you look up to? You, you talked about being out there at an early age. Were there goalies that you A, looked up to? Was there a point where there was someone where you started to maybe even model your game after different goalies? Uh, well, I grew up in Buffalo. So Ryan Miller, I was a huge fan of. I would say that is definitely the first goalie I ever looked up to. But, you know, right now I really love watching Vasilevsky play and just the way that he moves. You know, he's a lot bigger than I am, but, you know, just so technically sound and the way he's able to move and stretch is something I really admire. Okay, so you grew up and I, and I noticed there was a, was there a stop in Pittsburgh as well. I saw Buffalo, Pittsburgh and Detroit Yes. <laughs> moving around. Did you get a lot of different goalie coaches, different goalie voices? And is that a positive thing for you? Yeah, I definitely think so. You know, every coach you go to. I say to just take at least one piece of advice from them, learn one thing from them because, you know, everybody comes to the table and bring different ideas. And so definitely I think a culmination of all those goalie coaches and ideas have definitely made me the goalie I am today. And I was going to say, now you're heading to Cornell, probably a new goalie coach, a new, vo a new voice. There's a lot of kids uh, on, the, on the boys' side, on the women's side, at every level that are getting ready to go to a new season and they will have a new voice telling them something different. Advice on how to manage that Somebody's listening right now, like, how am I going to handle this without abandoning what you know your foundation to be? And that's definitely something I've struggled with myself. But, you know, you don't have to agree with everything they say. Um, if something feels you know is right for you, you know, maybe talk to them about it. But definitely continue to play the way you feel most comfortable with. But try new things. You know, they recommend something. Just try it for a couple of reps. See how it feels. You might like it better. You know, you might not. And just keep trying new things and learning from them. Okay. So, um, grew up playing with the boys. Like you said, this is the first time going in the women's game, but other than international experience differences, we were on the, we were recently on the ice with, with Kristen Campbell at a pro, uh, NHL camp with a lot of like high end shooters. And we're asking her about the differences between the, the men's and the women's game. What are you expecting? What do you, you know, like what is the difference when you go back and forth? Yeah, no, I think they have, a little bit more time to hold on to the puck. So the deception's a little bit different. Just the way that they're able to deceive you and hold on to the puck a little bit longer definitely makes you have to pay attention more, I think, to their stick blade and everything and just how they're going to pass the puck and all of that. Okay, so patience becomes a big thing too? Huge, yes. Okay, so we hear patience a lot. What is patience? Can you teach it? How do you learn it? Patience on your edges, holding edges against those, those shots, those the deception, not committing too early. What advice would you give on that? That's definitely something, you know, I've struggled with too. Um, I'd say Neil Conway, my goalie coach in Cleveland, we worked a lot on that. There's just certain drills that, you know, you just stay up on your feet to get those shots and even you're staying up to get the low shots. Um, so I just say practice 
staying on your feet and then really holding on to the release until seeing the release until you drop and watching the pucks all the way in to make sure. What are you most excited about going to Cornell? God, winning championships. <laughs> the history. Oh, how how yeah. familiar are you with with the history? Uh, pretty familiar. I know that they've been an incredible program in the past. They were number one in 2019. So I hope to get them to return there. I'm um, just super excited about our group of girls and I think we can go pretty far. Okay. Last one, because we're here with CCM. We've got you before you get on the ice in the new gear. There's, we're not allowed to say everything, but what's the first impressions of the new line, the Axis XF? I love them. The weight of them is just incredible. Um, so lightweight. Just love the way they feel. Probably the most comfortable pair of pads I put on to date. So super excited to get out there. People are going to hear this and they're going to be like, oh, I want to see pictures. And of course, we're not allowed to show them. But um, the stick as well, the new mask. Have you had the mask on before? Yes. Yeah, I love it. I've definitely never had a mask that light. So I'm excited to see how it goes. Okay. Uh, look forward to seeing you out there. Look forward to getting to know you a little bit over the next couple of days. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the Ingo Radio Podcast. Yes, of course. Thank you. Cornell. When you hear Cornell, Ken Dryden, my, my buddy Darren Elliott went there. Uh, David Lenevue uh, went ben there. Scrivens. Right? Ben Scrivens. Like, it's, it's a great historic goaltending uh, factory. One of my favorite masks of all time was Ben Scrivens at Cornell. And I told Annalise this story. They have a tradition there, apparently, that when the visiting team comes onto the ice, all of the fans, maybe it's just a student section or something, they just hold up newspapers. They're reading the newspaper. They couldn't care less about ah. the visiting team coming on the ice. So Scrivens had all the fan section holding up newspapers on the side of his bucket. Just love that one. Told Annalise she should add it. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, what do you What do you think? What was your connection with uh, Annalise? Oh well, always smiling, always happy, and uber competitive. So they they did this group of sort of skills on the ice with the goaltenders in Montreal at CCM stuff. Maybe they'll use for social media or something going down the road. One of them was those um, pylons that time you going through an obstacle course and. And they all went through this sliding exercise and most of the guys went and then Annalise went and she cleaned them all with her time because she pushed herself so hard. Another guy went, beat her time by a little bit. She gets this big smile on her face and she just goes right to the line. She says, I'm going again. <laughs> and of course she beat them. So uh, yeah, super, super competitive. And then there was a little bit of question mark about whether, um, you know, they'd all done the course exactly properly so she and this other guy are just chirping each other pretty much the rest of the weekend both with smiles on their faces uh just the kind of competitive nature but also good natured uh never sour over anything that uh, you would love to have on your team and she'd be the tallest goalie well i guess she's maddie, not short i guess maddie if we include maddie on the team but let's just say she'd be the tallest goalie on the in goal editorial staff that is true over six feet? Yeah. Six one, I think, isn't she? Yeah. And she's and she's like, yeah, she's legit. She's got a lot of talent. She's uh so the personality was was awesome getting to know her a little bit. Hopefully that quick interview is as much as we wish it was longer. Um was kind of sort of part of a Darren will know this term, part of a car wash uh type of type of environment where you're sort of they're going through one station to another uh, and they have a designated amount of time at each station. And uh, it was great to get to know her. But like I said, uh, looking forward to following up with another interview now that we got to spend a few days with her and get to know her even better. Because I think there's a lot more there than what we're able to share this time. And I look forward to to getting to share more of her story because I think we're going to be hearing her name for a long time uh, on the women's side of uh, of goaltending. Incredible access uh, for Ingle to be able to be part of that car wash as the players uh, cycle through. Uh, Gage Alexander, uh, talk about size. Six foot six is Western Hockey League product. Uh, grew up in Alberta, uh, spent his majority of his time in the WHL with the Winnipeg Ice and uh, and is now part of the Anaheim system. Uh, really interesting. For his first two years, he only played 16 games in the Western Hockey League due to the fact pandemic and et cetera, and was still uh, able to grab the attention coming out of uh, of those first two seasons. Yeah. And listen, um, 
Anaheim really likes this kid a lot. Uh, I didn't know much. I didn't know him. This was very much another get to know you interview with Gage. It was part of the car wash, but he didn't have anything before he was scheduled to join us. So he came over earlier. So he would have extra time with us, which was awesome. So a little bit of a longer interview, not our usual rambling 45 minutes, but we get into it a little deeper with Gage. And I can tell you that the Ducks are big on this kid. Uh, our good friend Sud- Sudarshan Maharaj uh, really, really likes the talent here and thinks they have something. And I know he, you know, he'll talk about it in this interview, the work he's done with Jeff Glass since. Uh, an incredible story to go from the WHL to the American League in the same season. And not I don't mean end of the season, like your junior season ends and the team calls you up. I mean, like less Sign. than a third of the way through the season, move up to the na- like to a National Hockey League contract and an American Hockey League job. That's what Gage Alexander did after his dub season started, well into his dub season, jumps to pro. And I mentioned this in the interview. We've heard this. I don't know how many times. Toughest jump for a goalie is junior or college to pro first year. It's not AHL once they acclimatize to NHL. They will all tell you that's the toughest jump, and he made it midseason. So there's obviously a lot to like about this kid. I really enjoyed talking to him and getting him to know him as well over those couple of days in Montreal. And you know, again, I think it's somebody we'll be hearing from again in the future. A second feature interview in this episode of Ingle Radio, the podcast, presented by Sensorina, Sensorina VR. Let's get to Gage Alexander. Really excited to welcome to the Ingo Radio podcast for the first time guest, hopefully first time of many, Gage Alexander, who is coming off a whirlwind season. I got to be honest, like I've been covering the league for 20 some odd years now. You don't see a lot of guys start in junior, make their way to pro midseason. So like just first off, what was that like to, to start the season playing in the dub, to end up going and playing a little bit in the coast, a little bit in the A? Like that's a massive leap. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, it was a pretty crazy year for me. Um, I think personally, I think, uh, I checked all my boxes of, of my goals that season. And, uh, my goal was to sign a contract with Anaheim and, uh, I had the lucky enough opportunity to do so. And, uh, fortunately for me, it, uh, worked out really well with me and called up kind of right away and, uh, kind of getting thrown to the wolves right away in San Diego. And, uh, played a couple games in the coast and then uh, I got called back up to San Diego and kind of never looked back from there. Okay. So, I mean, I can't, I'm trying to think of all the guys, like the, the message we hear the most from guys who establish themselves in the NHL, well, quite often we'll talk about what's the jump, like what's the jump from AHL to NHL. And most guys will tell us the biggest jump they make in their career is junior to pro. And they usually have a summer to get ready to do it. So what precipitated, good, good. I'm a journalist, right? Good job, Kev. What, what led to that move and that decision? Um, I just thought I was ready. Like I, yeah. I, I thought I was, I was mentally ready. I was mentally in a good spot. And uh, I thought it was uh, an opportunity you can't really say no to, right? So that's, that's your goal you dream of as a kid. And to sign that deal. Sign that deal and finally get an opportunity to play in front of, so many fans in professional arenas uh, every day and just have that expectations of being a, of being a pro hockey player every day is a pretty cool thing. So, um, yeah. Okay. So that jump, what was the biggest part? Like the skill, like everybody's, you know, everybody's an adult, you know what I mean? Like they're all fully growing, like the strength, like what did you notice was the biggest difference? The traffic? What was it? I thought it was definitely the pace of play and the traffic, like you said. I think uh, you don't really get that in the Western League. You get a little bit of it in the playoff time, but um, nothing that compares you and prepares you to be ready for that. And I think uh, uh, I'm a pretty coachable player, so I feel like when when uh, I kind of have an area to work on, I think I kind of hammer on that. And uh, Jeff Glass does a really good job with me in San Diego with all that. So. Um, a lot of, a lot of credits, a lot of people behind the scenes. Okay. We've had Jeff on the podcast before, um, got to know him over the years. Big fan. Also Sudsy. I hope I'm not telling tales out of school here, but I actually had a conversation with Sudsy about you before you signed. And I know how excited they were to have you on board, but when you talk about adjustments, especially making them against pro shooters, 
Can you give us a couple of examples? Like the audience is all goalie, so everybody yeah. speaks goalie. Were, yeah. were they technical? Were they tactical? Yeah, I think they were a little bit more tactical. Uh, I think my stance was a lot wider in junior than it was um, in the pro level. I think that was a thing that Glasser and Sedzi and I have been working on for the past two years is trying to narrow the stance. And uh, when I when I play with a narrow stance, I'm a lot more patient and uh, I'm able to read plays and, and make the right decision off that. So I think that was probably the biggest one. And um, dealing with the traffic as well and, and kind of fighting through screens and fighting sea pucks, I think, is, uh, is a big thing. So Okay. on the tra- I'll start with the traffic, and then I want to ask about stance. Because just on a, like specifics of dealing with traffic, part of it is that you just got to find a way to find the pocket. Yeah. We know that. Are there, you know, are there, are there, there's technique to it too. Yeah. Are there ways to manage traffic that any advice you could pass along at a young goal listening today, getting ready to head into a season is like, oh, I never thought of it that way. Something you learned. Yeah. I mean, uh, you always got to look short side. Uh, I learned that the hard way. I mean, you give, uh, you give good shooters a lot of net to shoot on short side. You're going to get exposed. And um, I think uh, just repetition with all that and getting comfortable with it and stuff. Uh, definitely makes you feel good about it and makes you feel confident. So you're going to play better. And um, yeah. As you move up the levels too, like you probably have teams that understand goalies are looking short side and they're trying to pull you off, like figuring out when you got to go to middle and things like that. Is that just like you said, reps and practice? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think it all kind of comes back to practice and and what you do there and, and how you kind of think, think of the game and, and, and certain situations and stuff. But I think it's uh, I think it's a pretty cool thing to realize the adjustments that you're making level to level and and and, and being happy with that but not satisfied and, and always kind of pushing for the next step. Okay, you you talked about stance and we've seen that around the league. You know, like that the games become so fast east west from a, an attacking yeah. standpoint that if we get too wide as goaltenders and we lock in on our edges, we're not as mobile. Yeah. So narrowed stance, shorter movements, those yeah. are trends we've seen. Mm-hmm. Sometimes really easy to say, but hard to do, especially as a taller goalie. You can feel like you're a long ways from the ice. What allowed you, what did you focus on to get comfortable in that transition? Um, just honestly, just mental. I think it's a lot about uh, killing the habits of, of being wide and, and realizing when you're too wide. And I think it's kind of your own, you're, you're in your own head a bit about it. But uh, I think it's good because you know what you're doing right and you know what you're doing wrong. So I think the stance is is a huge thing and, and I realize it now on other goalies when they get kind of caught and oh that guy was too wide and um but I think for me I think it was it was really just about keeping my stance narrow and for me being the size I am to be able to stop a puck and have a better chance at it is is it like do you have to get comfortable with where in the zone you start to widen out like is that just take time and experience yeah yeah I think definitely I think uh like I said, there's different situations that you use if you're a little bit wider, if the puck's tighter into you, or uh, if it's kind of coming out of the corner a little bit, you're a little bit wider trying to get to back to the other posts. So you're not exposing that. But, uh, yeah, I think it's just repetition and, and being confident in yourself in certain situations. Okay, so I want to get to know you a little bit, like a little quick get-to-know Gage Alexander session. How would you become a goalie? Where did this all start for you, the passion? Um, I know my dad, actually, he used to shoot tennis balls at me in the garage when I was very little, and he would just rip them. And no he, mercy. Yeah, no, no mercy at all. And I think that kind of was a way of him saying it was okay for me to be a goalie, and he was confident about that. And I think that's kind of where it all started. And, and uh, you couldn't really keep me out of the net. I didn't want to do anything else. And uh, that was kind of the love of the game. Did you play hockey before that other, like out, or was you I, always a goalie? I played like half and half season. Like I played out for half and I played in, uh, in net for half. So I kind of was always leaning towards the net, but I couldn't do that at that young age. You know, you kind of have to do everything. But I think after that, we kind of all realized that that's what I wanted to do. And yeah. Okay. Uh, where did uh, any, like I'm, I'm thinking of goalie coaches, influences along the way, maybe even for starters, Who'd you admire growing up? Was there a guy that you watched and was like, "Yeah, I want to play like that"? Uh, it, it was Jonathan Quick, actually. You probably would never guess that, but uh, Jonathan Quick was my guy growing up, and uh, I think uh, I just love the flexibility and the athleticism, and I think that was one part of his game that I definitely kind of took because 
I'm, I'm able to move pretty well for a big guy and, and uh, just kind of lean back on my athleticism sometimes and go from there. As you turn pro, as you evolve, well, I mean, even before turning pro, as you evolve as a goaltender, was it, have you had to dial that back a little bit or is it a matter of knowing when to lean on it without yeah. overusing it? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always people that are going to tell you you use it too much or you don't use it enough. And I think it's just kind of the, the happy medium of having success with it and, and kind of pushing yourself to, to do something you're not really comfortable with, but you kind of feel like it's going to benefit you a little bit better. You know, we're heading into a time, a time of the year. I mean, you're going back to San Diego where you'll have a comfort level with the goalie coaches. I guess when you're at camp, Dave Rook will be there, you know, from the NHL level. But, you know, you arrive there. It's new voices to an extent. We're at a time of year where a lot of kids are going to see a new team, maybe a new goalie coach. We just had that, you know, some guys will tell you to do this. Some guys will tell you it's too much. They want more. How you find that balance between trying new things, learning new things is a question we ask a lot of goalies and sticking true to yourself yeah i think uh i think it's honestly how you communicate with your goalie coach i think it's a big thing right if you don't have that communication level of of being like hey like this feels really good and i like this and i'm, I'm probably going to use this in a game situation if i can keep getting reps on it and stuff but i also think it's the open mind to try things new i know i helped glasser run a kids camp uh, a couple of weeks ago in calgary and um, a lot of goalies are very set in their way. They th they think that uh, this is the way, and I've seen so many NHL guys do this, and I'm going to do that. And I think really it's just about having an open mind about all of it, and and being able to try new things and not get frustrated with it. You actually saw that with kids, like they were. Yeah. You're trying to teach them. You played pro, yeah. and they're like, no, no, I'm not doing it yeah, that way. Yeah, yeah. It's just kind of like the tendency of kids. I don't know if it's just kind of kids these days. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you about that because I saw some of the clips, and I know, like, like I said, we're big fans of Jeff Glass, and and um, what was that like? Like, can you take anything away from that? Even though though you're coaching kids who are who are you know not at that level yet. Do you, do you learn anything the other way? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I was that kid once right at the camp looking up to the guy that was playing pro or major junior or whatever. So I think it was, uh, I was very thankful for the opportunity from Gloucester to, to help him out with that camp and just kind of help the kids for the most part, try and understand what they kind of need to do to be successful and, and to kind of build confidence in themselves. I feel like a lot of young goalies are very hard on themselves and very hard on the situation that they're put in and tryouts and, and cuts and whatever. So I just feel like if the goalie's confident and they're going to definitely play better if they're confident. What about yourself? Like, yeah, you've been in tough situations over the years. I mean, I would argue last year is a situation that, um, not so much tough, but like that's got to be challenging mentally. Like all of a sudden you go from junior where you've got billet, you know, to you're living on your own, you're taking care of yourself. There's a lot of pressure that comes with that. Advice from the mental side of game. How have you learned to handle that pressure? I'm not sure if I'm able to give that out, <laughs> but I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm it's, still working uh, on it. Yeah, it's still working on. It. You work on it every day, right? You try and try and feel mature, and you're trying to feel comfortable in the situation and stuff. But you're really not until a certain point in your life. And I think the best way is just kind of, kind of do what makes you happy and. And just to try and be mentally ready for those situations the best you can and and just kind of visualize what, what you want to do every day and, and how you're going to do it and stuff. And I think uh, that kind of separates people at the next level. Are you a guy that studies other goaltenders? You mentioned Jonathan Quick. Like, as that was your guy growing up, as you got older, as your game evolved, um, did you start looking at other guys? Like, some guys like to actually look for tendencies even of yeah. goalies and hey maybe i'll try this yeah i mean uh through the later part uh of like my minor hockey or whatever i watched mike smith a lot uh that was kind of my uh draft guy that the teams would ask me about and stuff like that and who i modeled my game after and stuff and uh i was able to watch him quite a bit he played in calgary at edmonton there for a couple of years and uh i watched him countless games and stuff like that. I loved his puck handling and, and that's a huge part of my game. Um, and Pecorine actually, he was, uh, he's a very athletic moves well for a big guy. And, and, uh, he tries to react, um, 
rely on that reactive part of the game too. My favorite story about Pekka Rene was him when UC Saros came in and UC played deeper than Pekka. And Pekka at that stage of his career, like I think he had a Vesna already or was going to be his Vesna. Actually, he got the Vesna the next year, recognizing from this goalie who was smaller than him that played less aggressively, like that constant evolution willing to change. Mike Smith changing his game to play a little more goal line out, uh, uh, you know, out mentality when he was in Arizona, which you saw in Edmonton and Calgary. Describe your game for us. Yeah, I think uh, I'm a good puck handling goalie. I uh, I replays pretty well. My athleticism is my my key strength, I think, and um, I think just relying on my size is a, is a huge part for me. Read the game. That's something we tried in goal to help kids with with the pro reads. How is it something? Does it come instinctual, innate, or? Can you work on it? Is it a skill you can improve? Yeah, I mean, there's certain drills in, in practice that you can work on. Uh, two-on-one drills, reading the play, three-on-twos, power play in practice. And there's a lot of things to kind of to build that hockey IQ, but sometimes it's you can't really be taught that. I think it's just kind of natural and and your natural ability to, to read the play and to kind of be one step out of it. Do you, like, especially now that you're in pro, where do, what does video play, if any, role in yeah. sort of that continued evolution of reading the play? Because yeah. also you're in a new league facing shooters you've never seen yeah. before. How much video did you work on with Glasser on that? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 A lot, Is a it a tool you like for yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. I never, never in my first kind of couple of years of junior, I wasn't a huge fan. I kind of thought it was a waste of time as a, as a young kid. You do. You kind of think, what am I doing here? But um now that you kind of take a little bit more pride in yourself and it's a business now and i feel like uh you spend a couple hours extra a week on video i think it's going to benefit you for those games that you kind of maybe aren't there fully uh, but you're relying on your information in your head about certain shooters or your tendencies to do this when a shooter does that um i think it's i think it's a very important feature and it's so easy accessible nowadays to every goalie so especially at the pro level i guess even now with instat it's even you can get a junior too yeah yeah so it's that was kind of the thing that kind of got me into it most was instat and you kind of get sent it after every game and you can kind of break it down full game wise and, and whatever but i think uh i think it's a pretty cool tool as much as you've got a goalie coach now full time uh in the american league um do you, is part of the process learning to evaluate your own, to become your, that's one, Ian Clark, a goalie coach who I've worked with for years, uh, you know, in Vancouver. Um, it's one of his things that we got, we can't, they need to become their own goalie coach mm. too. Is that part of the process yeah. for you? Yeah, definitely. And I think, uh, I think Sudzy was a huge part in that for me. Um, he was a huge mentor for me. Um, and he kind of believed in me when I didn't believe in myself sometimes. And I think uh, I think just having that is, is is big. You'd hear from him when things weren't going well, like yeah. a little tire pump and a little yeah, yeah, exactly. He he. I remember this one time he came to the Swift Current and I was I was struggling quite a bit and I was frustrated and he came in and he he kind of tore me a new one and I'm like, wow, well, okay, like all right, I'll I'll get it done then, Zadzi for sure. And then uh, after that, I kind of really took that to heart and and, and kind of ran with that and. Uh, had some had some success. So tough love works too sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I think whether uh, it's tennis balls or, uh, <laughs> in the garage or or, or your your first NHL goalie coach coming in and and uh, laying it out for you. Yeah, for sure. So I think uh, I think Sadzi was a huge part in the self coaching part. I think uh, you have to kind of realize when you do stuff that isn't correct and and kind of readjust that and to kind of be in your own head about it. Okay, so this is gonna might sound like a weird one. Especially if you, we'll see. We've had guys, as much as the jump from junior to pro is always the biggest one. Like every guy's told us that. In some ways, especially you may have even noticed it coast to A, the game can become a little more predictable and a little more controlled. There's less mistakes. Yeah. In some ways, can it be easier? Um, Maybe easier is not the right word. I, w- I would say just like the ability to read the play and that the plays are going to kind of 
unfold on the way that you see them. I right. know my first couple of games in the coast, I had such a hard time. I, I couldn't read any plays. It's a bit of a rodeo down there. It's, it's a bit choppy. The game plays choppy. Lots of penalties. You, you got to kill lots of penalties. But and, the skill's still really high. Yeah, the yeah. skills, the, the top end players in the coast are really good players that maybe haven't figured it out in other areas of their game. But I think, uh, I think it's a great league to kind of get adjusted to and and to understand that every kind of every pro player has some talent that it's just what separates them. And you get to the A is just a little more guys are where they're supposed to be more often, less mistakes, at least fewer, a little bit compared to before. Yeah, your mistakes definitely show. Uh, I think uh, I remember this one time I not very good time management or clock management or whatever you want to call it. I, I got a shot from the point right into my glove and I kind of glance up and I thought I saw three seconds on the clock. So I kind of throw it to the corner and then they get the puck in the corner, dished up the D man and then they rip it in the net and like two, two seconds left in the, in, in the period. And it, we go into a tie and uh, going into the third period. And I heard from that one, but I think it's just like about being comfortable in those situations that kind of make you a better goaltender and a better person. I feel like you, you you're learning from that one, right? Yeah. Yeah. You learn from those mistakes and and you kind of build off that and you know, not to do it again, or you know how to do it this way and stuff. So I feel like mistakes are going to happen. Obviously a lot of mistakes are going to happen, but it's just kind of how you move forward uh, through those mistakes. Opportunity to grow. How did uh, this year shape your summer? Um, I mean, obviously, like I said, like, Pretty rare to go from junior all the way to the American League in one year, in season. Yeah. Anything you learned that changed the way you prepared this summer? Yeah, I definitely took some time off after the season to kind of decompress after the crazy season. I was bouncing around pretty hard, putting on a lot of kilometers, what I'm used to. So I think the the rest part was huge and getting my body into a good state before I started training and stuff and um, getting a taste of what pro was like and, and the idea of playing pro every day. It's it's not easy, right? You got you got to separate yourself from the others, and I think I did that this summer, uh, working out lots and skating with Jeff a lot. So um, I think I'm putting myself in a good spot. I was going to ask you to get a chance, like we saw at the camp, but you get a chance to train with him this summer yeah, as well. Yeah, he's my guy in the summer. Lucky enough, has he, he been your guy before? Or just uh, like since not the since not since before Anaheim. Anaheim. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I think uh, I, I get to work with him every summer. He comes back to Calgary, and uh, I think that's awesome. I, get to be on the same page as yeah, your guy. Yeah, exactly. And you kind of get to build that relationship, and you see the bad days, you see the good days, and and you're kind of able to to go off that. But yeah, I'm very fortunate enough to have Glasser in Calgary. Okay, last one. Are you a gear guy? Did you grow up a gear guy? Uh, you- yes and no. Okay. Uh, I never, I never had the best pads until the, the Western League. So I was kind of very kind of slow with all that but uh jerry's helped me out quite a bit uh, but you appreciate it oh yeah definitely definitely a more of an appreciation guy no i mean everybody's different right like not everybody has to be and this is a reference that may be lost on you but if you watch baseball at all remember ichiro suzuki okay so like i'm a baseball guy vancouver so go to seattle all the time ichiro suzuki used to keep his bats in a humidor so that they were temperature and like um everything was controlled humidity was controlled yeah i don't think every goalie needs to be that I do think we need to know how our gear works on our legs, on yeah. our hands, on our body. Yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, I'm a very simple gear guy, and we got three Velcro straps and uh, just one single break, and uh, just very simple on that. And you like straight pads, though. Like yeah. Stefan Wade is the goalie coach here today. We're at the CCM yeah. event, and Steph coached Corey Crawford to a Stanley Cup in Chicago, mm-hmm. and we, we were in the room looking at your pads. Have you seen yeah, your pads yet? I haven't Whoops, yet. I got to be careful here. That, <laughs> but that you like a straight pad. Yeah. He reminded him of Corey Crawford's yeah. pads, that straight. Like, what do you like about that straight setup? Uh, I think it just benefits my game quite a bit. Got a pretty it, wide butterfly, I'm yeah, guessing? Yeah, yeah, wide butterfly. Um, I think just the ability to have a big straight pad, I think, is such an advantage compared to a, a double break soft pad like you're – uh, there's a lot of areas in the game where straight pads are really good and you get those rebounds off. And I think in the post, they seal a lot better. And uh, I've been wearing the same spec pads for six years now. So I should have done my research a little bit more in terms of uh, watching your game. I apologize for this, but like with their that straight and long, 
in a wide butter like do you have a narrow enough butterfly that they feel like Corey used to like it sort of formed a little yeah. triangle in front of him pucks yeah. off the body that you didn't control would always end up sitting behind the pads yeah. in a safe spot yeah yeah no i think uh i think it's probably in the medium uh, uh the medium of that and i think uh I don't, i'm not really sure to be honest i i feel like i feel like i'm, I'm not super wide but i'm i'm narrow enough because my stance has gotten right. narrow now that my butterfly has gotten narrower and stuff so yeah Pads meet in the middle, stop to five volts, all you need to yeah, know, right? Exactly. Awesome. Gage, this has been really fun. Look forward to watching you out there, getting to know you a little bit over the next couple of days here at the event. I won't give away anything about the gear, but it's pretty sick looking. Enjoy that, uh, enjoy that debut in a few minutes. Yeah, I'm excited. Thank you. Appreciate it. You see people that big, and it's it's hard to even Put yourself in the same position when somebody has such a size difference. Sometimes it's an advantage, sometimes it's not. But uh, but you're dealing with some raw tools there. Yeah, and, and like I said, um, you know, hopefully not telling tales out of school here because it was shared with me uh, by by Sudsy how much they like him in Anaheim, what how much of a a good set of skills and tools they think they have there, and uh, they wanted to get him obviously up early and. And a part of the organization, and uh, he did, you know, he did pretty well, sort of getting thrown into the deep end of the pool the way he did. Like that's a big, like, forget about all the stuff we know on the ice about that jump, but off the ice, right? Like to go from playing in the dub, billet families, everything's taken care of, to hey, he spent some time in the coast, um, where you're very much left to your own devices quite often, you know, like figure out how to live, how to eat, how to eat properly, how to take care of yourself, how to get the proper rest. Um, there's a lot that goes into that jump beyond just the level of shooters and the requirements of the schedule at the pro level and all those things. And, um, it's impressive what he did last year. And again, I, I know the ducks are big on him. Uh, they like the, the package that he brings and, and I'm really excited. I'm excited to see him likely in Abbotsford as he comes through town with San Diego this year and, and to see him and Jeff Glass working together. They spent the summer together, as you heard Gage talking about. He's got to spend a lot of time working with kids. I love that part of the conversation. Uh, excited to see him there and then down the road, excited to see him in the National Hockey League as well. As that comes towards us, uh, you can dive into the now over at uh, Ingle, uh and really digest uh, a lot of stuff that's uh, that's on the, the site right now, Hutch. A, all kinds of different uh, presentations. Yeah, lots up there now and lots to come because we have had such a busy end to the summer. We just have to sift through everything before we can get it all up on the site, but it's going to keep rolling. I can't even count the number of pro reads that we're ready to roll out, but one of them is a new one. First time pro reader, long time in goal reader, Jet Greaves. I think we mentioned in the last show how he was quoting to us things that he'd seen uh, on our site many years ago, uh, the Carey Price dead arm VH. He mentioned one video that was quite popular, and uh, he really sees the game well. One of the things that I like about this week's pro read, especially Woody, Woody's the creator of pro reads. He's the the genius behind all this, and it was because so much negativity exists on the internet. Woody wanted to be able to present something in a positive light. Let's look at a save. Tell us what you saw, why you did what you did. We've had a couple of people as they're doing it critique themselves. So it's kind of fun to see them point out mistakes. And uh, I remember Carter Hart specifically uh, pointing something out in the early days. And Jet himself at the beginning of this one sort of off camera said, ah, not sure I like what I did here, but let's talk about it anyway. And so the fact that we can learn some great stuff in positive lights while realizing that pros make some mistakes too and, and are a little bit self-critical Really liked it. So he analyzes this one from a bunch of different angles. Uh, talk about a number of different things. Great pro read with many more to come from Jet. And uh, also while you're on the site, go check out the pro gear uh, tip from Martin Jones, new Toronto Maple Leaf guy, uh, talking to Kevin about how he does his stick grip. We always like these things where guys tape their sticks and tell us about what they do and why they do it. We've got several in the can, by the way, from the CCM event in Montreal that we can't unveil yet because they're with a new stick that nobody's seen. Tease, tease, tease. Coming soon, both parts, both the fact you'll see the stick soon in the NHL and the stick taping. Man, it's... Oh, sure hope God, so, it's yeah. good. It's they're good. Re they're really good, including including 
I'm, t- I'm patting myself on the back. Devin Levi changed the way he tapes a stick very, very slightly because of something I said. I thought that was kind of cool. We'll see what happens when that hold happens. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. You got Devin Levi to change the way he tapes a stick? In a very, very subtle way. You'll see it when the video comes out. Huh. Darren, we influencers, baby. We'll say it has something to do with his jersey number. That's all I'll say. So, ah. Uh, and not writing that, his jersey number on the stick. It's more interesting than that, mildly. On the note of Devin Levi and goalies being critical of themselves at times. Same thing with his pro reads. He had his pro reads debut the week before. And he talked about not so much critical as, hey, like, given how early he recognizes a certain situation is coming, he probably could have played it a little deeper than he did, Mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. increased the distance. Again, that honesty. And I think the thing about pro reads, it wasn't just about positive light. It was that all the criticism of goalies never gave them a chance that we saw on the internet. He should have done this. He should have done that. Well, typically, there's there are times they make mistakes. 100%. It's, hey, man, it's Monday morning QB. It's easy from the couch, right? Um, But in the moment, sometimes they make those decisions for a reason. Like, oh, he should have been here. He should have used this save. Well, no, he was actually using the other one for a reason. And that's what we wanted to get into pro reads. Let the goalies explain what they were thinking and why so that other young goalies can understand the thought process that goes on at the highest level. And so that's where we love, and we've seen this from a lot of guys, like not ripping themselves, but, you know, being critical. Hey, I could have done this different, or maybe it would have been an easier save. Maybe I don't need to go into a spread if I beat it on my feet by taking a little less ice. So all that sort of thinking and thought process and how it plays out, they're sharing it in real time on video so young goalies can see it and hopefully engage in the same thought process themselves. It is as much as everything comes down the pipe with Ingle, the most fascinating part uh, of the of the site is is pro rates. You don't. It's just a total welcome you behind the uh, into the world of that particular goaltender, National Hockey League goaltender, uh, American Hockey League goaltender. Be able to to experience that is is amazing. And folks, there's uh, like almost 190 of them online. If you're an Ingle subscriber, you can go back and watch them all. Right back to our first ones with Carey Price when we said, hey, we're thinking about doing this. Do you want to be our guinea pig and see how it goes? And mushroom clouds were going off in my head as he's picking things out that I never would have thought to look for. He was incredible and we knew we had something. You can access all of it with a, an annual membership. You get the full access to the archives. And as much as there's almost 190 of them in the can now, how many, like 35 different goalies Hutch now we're up to in that area, Um, including Vesna Trophy winner Linus Allmark from this past season, Thatcher Demko, Connor Hellebuck we did this summer. Uh, We have another, we have close to another 60 already in the can for the upcoming season. And we're going to continue to add big names and big voices and big moments for our crowd at Ingle. We may even get to the point as we get through them all that we're able to start dropping more than one a week every once in a while just to make sure we don't lose some of these voices and insights over time. 35 goalies, 192 pro reads as of today. And if you sign up today at inglemag.com, it's only 50 bucks Canadian. You'll get all 192 and another year to come, another more, more than 50. Not to mention close to a thousand other videos on drills, tips, advice, gear, everything from how to tape a stick, how we tape our sticks from the pros to drills with NHL goalie coaches and NHL goalies, why they do certain things, what the focal points are. There's a reason we have well over 200 professional and well at up to the NHL goalie coaches from all over the world that subscribe to the site. I don't think there's a better resource out there for young goalies and goalie coaches. Um, it's interesting to me that. At the highest level, a lot of people subscribe. Uh, but if you're a kid, don't be shy. There's stuff for there that on there for you as well. It's right there. It's it's begging for you. It's it's a resource that you cannot take advantage of. You cannot afford to t- take adv- not take advantage of it. Uh, do you guys when you tape your sticks, do you do the whole blade, or do you leave some exposed? Definitely not the whole blade. No, no, not the whole blade. Okay, I'm sort of more the, just the sock, a, I, I tape I, it on I the toe. That's called. Yeah. I tape it out on the toe a little bit. You know what, though? Some of these blades are so sexy, I just don't want to cover them all up. I, I don't oh. want to like, and, and trust me, this new stick that's coming, you're not going to want to tape over that sexy blade. It is hot, unless you're Annalise Bergman. She taped it damn near up to the bottom of the CCM logo. Like, I think like, she doubled the weight of that twig. 
Yeah, they they think oh, she yeah. added forty grams to the weight of the twig. They said like yeah, it was... you can go right you can go right at the bottom of the heel where it touches the ice uh, or and to the to the toe right to the top, or you can just do that little spot right in the middle. I've seen a couple. Of, Logan Thompson does it like that. There's just a little patch right in the middle. What did you do in the old days, exposed. Darren? You me- remember when the heels used to split before they started putting oh, plastic yeah, yeah. inserts there? I'd do a couple strips of tape along the heel before I started wrapping it because you didn't want anything to get in there. I do plastic and then cloth. And then tape the stick Ooh. to to avoid the water getting in there. Smart. I should have thought of that. And now veteran move. In, yeah, cheap, cheap, right over here. Cheap, cheap. I hey, that would have foam cores were like that for the longest time too. They would that's mm-hmm. where they would get soft first. I remember even even somebody who's as new to it as I am at 15 years into the position. I remember taping that bottom heel area to make sure it wouldn't break early. Well, you'll still never be able to measure up to Hutch and I doing the chest protector and the arms with separate uh, pieces. Boys, I will never measure up to you in any way, so let's be honest. (laughs) Technically, I'll never measure up to either of you because I'm the short one. Uh, there's, uh, I I won't even go down the path. There was something else I was going to go into that, uh, that Woody makes a little bit uh, of a joke with you about considering your glove size, uh, over the, uh, over the course. Let's leave leave that. We're going to leave that one alone today. Yeah. We'll leave that. There's nothing dirty. Don't, don't, don't go down a path here, people. There's nothing bad about it. We just make fun of Hutch, uh, or considering, uh, uh, part of him. Let's uh, say goodbye now, and we'll gather again in one week and uh, see what we're seeing as far as uh, some captain skates uh, are on the ice and some different uh, training camps and uh, gearing towards rookie camps and rookie tournaments uh, that are starting. Uh, Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, Yes, Woody? One less tease because I haven't been able to shut up all podcasts. Folks, keep your eyes out. We did spend that week in Montreal. There's some things we can't reveal yet, but they are going to be revealed soon by the guys wearing them including one rather prominent National Hockey Leaguer that will be wearing the new gear any day now at his captain skates. We've got our eyes tuned. Make sure you check out our social media. We'll try and be on top of that for you. It's uh, it's a big one. In Goal Radio, the podcast presented by the Hockey Shop, source for sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com.